Hello and uh, welcome to the first in a series of Y webinars about a new approach to the evaluation of Y chromosome DNA profiles in forensic science. Uh, they'll be presented by me together with my colleague uh, Mikkel Anderson. So my name is David Balding. I haven't worked as a forensic scientist, but I've done a lot of uh, research and expert witness work uh, related to the evaluation of DNA profiles, a lot of it done in the UK. Uh, I've moved uh, back to Australia for the last uh, five years and you can see I'm now affiliated with the University of Melbourne. So as I mentioned, this is talk one. There are a number of others that are, and I'll go through them briefly at the end of this talk. Uh, we're just gonna talk here about single source STR Y profiles. Uh, there'll be some more advanced topics and further developments, software and so on in the, in the follow on talks. Uh, I'm gonna be presenting a new approach uh, that um, we think is particularly useful for the modern profiles that are highly informative due to our high mutation rate, uh, but they're still useful for, for older profiles as well. Uh, the approach hasn't yet been widely used, but we think it, uh, it's gaining traction and we hope that it will become more prominent in the future. Uh, now, I'll give a reference at the end that's uh, got all the details. Uh, most of the results presented here are all gonna be in the publication, so don't worry too much if you don't pick up everything the first time through. Uh, and as I said, there'll also be the other talks to give you further information. So the starting point is the basic uh, transmission of Y chromosome from fathers to sons more or less intact, except for some uh, mutations, which are higher than other chromosomes, but still uh, are relatively rare. Uh, the, as uh, many of you will know, Y profiles are particularly useful when there's a mixture of male and female origin DNA, and the male is the contributor of interest, or, or in some cases, more than one male. Um, and this is particularly useful if the male is a low-level contributor. And of course, in that case, there can be some dropout with some uh, alleles not showing up in the profile. I won't focus too much on that here. It doesn't, it, if there's only a little bit of dropout, it doesn't matter too much for what I'm talking about here, but there'll be a little bit more about partial profiles in subsequent talks. But uh, mainly we're thinking about a good uh, single source DNA profile and some of the modern kits have more than 20 loci. And some of them have, some of these loci have high mutation rates. Uh, so this plot, shows a histogram of empirical mutation rates um, for 29 loci on the Y chromosome that are used in one or other of the uh, forensic uh, Y profiling kits. And you can see there's quite a big range with a lot of loci having low mutation rates down here, but some of the more recently developed loci having very high um, mutation rates above 1% per generation. The curve here is a curve that we fitted to these data, um, and the, there's details of the curve, but we used it as a kind of prior distribution in the mutation rates to, to allow for some variability in the, in the work I'm gonna be discussing here. It doesn't matter too much, the details. So as a result of uh, combining these mutation rates over however many loci are in the profiling kit, we come up with a total mutation rate, that's the probability that a son's profile is different from his father's, uh, for here for three uh, prominent uh, Y profiling kits. Uh, and you can see that the t this total mutation rate is very high for Y filer plus up uh, approaching uh, 15%. So that's a 15% probability that a son's profile is different from his father's. Powerplex Y23, I'll call that an intermediate rate here, just a little bit below 10%. Uh, and then Y filer is a little below 5% for the total mutation rate. Um, and the work we're discussing here is um, the method we're proposing is relevant no matter what the mutation rate, but it becomes more important in for the, high, the higher the mutation rate. So why is that the case? The high mutation rate, of course, is good. It makes the Y profiles highly discriminatory. Uh, and in particular, I want to emphasize this point, which is central to what we're talking about here, that matches pretty much don't occur. You can ignore them a match if the alleged source of the DNA Q and the alternative source X 
uh, do not share a recent male line ancestor. So matches hardly ever occur and, and so rarely that they can be neglected. Matches only occur if the two individuals have a relatively recent um, male line ancestor. So um, the question is how recent? And that's what I'm gonna be going on to in more detail in this talk, but broadly speaking, uh, for the high mutation rate profiles, it's a matter of several tens of father-son steps uh, for the mutation rate to remain reasonably high. And of course, going out several tens uh, is well beyond the range of known relatives. So there can be people out there, ma males out there, uh, that are related at this level to a given male, uh, but of course the relationship will typically be unknown. Um, but nevertheless, it's close enough that these distantly related males could be from a similar location, some social characteristics in common, some physical characteristics in common. Uh, and this might make it more likely for the wrong person to be accused uh, when in fact the source of the DNA is a relative of the alleged contributor. So all these points I'll develop a little bit more in the subsequent slides. Uh, but. Um, but this key point is that it's the, you know, it's the relatedness between the alleged source of the DNA and the alternate source of the DNA uh, that's key. So here's a picture to kind of indicate, this is just a toy made up male line uh, genealogy. Here, uh, every circle is a, is a male individual. Uh, I've just shown three locus haplotypes here and just made up alleles with the, with the ancestor here, having zero, zero, zero as the haplotype. Um, and so here's an alleged contributor Q. Uh, that's his father there, that's his brother. Uh, there's grandfather, uncle, and you can count the male line steps just by counting up these arrows. So it's one step to the father, two steps to the grandfather, three steps to the uncle. There's another relative here that's a bit further away. Uh, I mean, what you define to be a close relative is of course a bit arbitrary, whether that's close or not is maybe a bit borderline, but certainly these ones over here are related to Q, but so distantly that he's probably not aware of them under sort of uh, typical kind of social uh, norms. Um, and the number of father-son steps uh, is, you know, of the order of 10 or 20 between Q and these individuals over here. Uh, not all of them match, of course, because there's some mutations, but quite a number of them do. And, and these are, you know, typically the ones we have to consider as the alternate sources of the DNA. Because I said the you know completely unrelated males are so unlikely to match that we can basically ignore that. So, how do we convey the weight of evidence for a Y profile match? Well, they've been used in court for over twenty years, and I would say we still don't really have a good answer to this question. Um, there's a number of different proposals. I've in fact made different proposals in the past that are superseded by the approach that I'm now uh, putting forward. Um, but the most common approach is something along the lines of reporting that the Y profile of Q was observed X times in a database of N profiles. And some might give an up a 95% confidence limit, uh, which uh, makes the answer a little bit more generous to the defense and uh, but doesn't really solve a lot of uh, fundamental problems, although it, it helps a little bit. So here are some of the problems as I see it. Um, the number of possible distinct profiles is huge. So what I mean by that is given the alleles that exist at every locus, if I just go along and pick out one allele at random at every locus and put them together and call that a profile, it's absolutely overwhelmingly likely that that doesn't exist in the population even though all the individual alleles do exist, any particular combination almost certainly doesn't exist because there's such a vast number over 20 or more, lo more loci, there's such a vast number of potential profiles that you could make up by putting together observed alleles in a random way. Um, and it's vastly more than the number of males on earth. So a great majority of them don't exist. And that's gonna be important for some of the things that I talk about later that any, uh, any kind of profile that you make up, if you haven't observed it in the population, it probably doesn't exist in the population. So that's number one. The next is that the profiles that do exist are mostly not represented in the database because of the, whatever it is, several billion 
males on Earth, um, there is a lot, very large number of distinct profiles. Um, and most of them won't be represented in any particular database. So in other words, that frequency will be zero. Some of them will be represented in the database, of course. Uh, most of them only once, so that frequency is one. Um, but it's a little bit just hit and miss whether the frequency is zero and one. It's not really very informative uh, one way or the other. And now potentially, if it's observed more than once in the database, you might think that's informative, but there another problem comes up because um, if a profile is represented more than once, uh, then that basically is reflecting related individuals in the database and how many relatives there are in the database is going to depend a lot on how the database was assembled. Uh, it's almost never a, a kind of proper scientifically designed random sample. It's always a database is nearly always a convenient sample of some sort. And so therefore the, re the representation of relatives in the database might not be anything like what exists in the population. So there are problems um, all the way um, through uh, with the using database frequencies. And we can't really overcome these problems, but um, but the broad conclusion from this is that databases are not as informative as you might think, uh, and there's uh, you know different approaches might be better for for conveying the weight of evidence. So let's come back to this major problem I've highlighted: is that um, the probability that two males uh, match uh, depends strongly on a quantity that is usually unknown: uh, the number of male line generations between them. Um, now, um, different finders of fact, a, a judge or a jury, will make different judgments about who could be the source of the DNA. And you've got here this fixed set of relatives of the alleged contributor, distant relatives of the alleged contributor, and what fraction they are of the possible sources of the DNA is going to depend a lot on those judgments about, you know, do you just consider the people very close to the crime scene, in the nearby bigger town, in the distant city? the region, the country, um, those judgments are really a matter for the court and they're gonna affect a lot the, the fraction of matching individuals in the relevant population. <coughs> and that's more or less what a match probability is or you know, not quite, but it's closely related. Um, so these kind of match probability calculations require judgments about the size of the population. They're very sensitive to the size of the population and that's a matter for the court and not the forensic scientist. So that's a fundamental problem. And it goes quite deep because it really, um, the match probability is a special case of the likelihood ratio. It's just the inverse here, which is a, doesn't matter too much uh, whether it's which way up the likelihood ratio is, but conventionally it's, uh, it's the, the likelihood ratio is one on the match probability. Um, now the likelihood ratio is a more general uh, concept uh, than the match probability, but where they both exist, they're, 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 they're more or less the same thing. Um, so I've been a big fan, and so has Mikkel, of using the likelihood ratio. It's been, it's been quite successful in many areas with DNA and other kinds of evidence. It's got strong theoretical support, uh, but it is, unfortunately, does suffer this problem here. And so I'm gonna go to it in a little bit detail because it's an important point um, that, um, if we go back here, let me put this out of the way again. Um, the, um, the likelihood ratio, just to remind you, is uh, just loosely speaking, it's the probability of the evidence given the prosecution version of events, the prosecution story, let's call it hypothesis proposition, um, compared to the probability of the same evidence under a defense scenario. So if we write CSP for the crime scene profile or, or sometimes called the evidence profile, uh, because it doesn't necessarily come from the crime scene, um, then we could say that the likelihood ratio is the probability of observing that evidence profile if the, um, if the DNA came from the alleged contributor Q uh, divided by that same probability under the alternative scenario that the DNA came from some other male X. And the problem we've been focusing on is that this likelihood ratio, well, that has many good properties. It does vary a lot according to the unknown patrilineal relatedness of Q and X. So if X is say up to about 10 father-son steps away from, uh, from Q, uh, then he's very likely to match. Uh, if he's 100 steps away, he's almost certain not to match. Uh, 
And so basically, you know, this is like, you know, one or zero answer according to this factor that you typically don't know. Now, most statisticians, well, one of when, you know, we deal with unknowns all the time and there's various things that you do when you don't know something, you estimate it uh, or you average over the possible values. But it's hard to do, get the averaging right here because of the problem I mentioned previously that, you know, are these X cl closely related to Q a small fraction of the possible contributors or a large fraction of the possible contributors is not really a judgment that the forensic scientists can make. So there's no good solution here. You can't really estimate this relatedness. You typically just won't know. Um, they, um, so that's the problem. And, and again, it's particularly um, acute with the high mutation rate profiles uh, that are now available. Uh, you get stronger evidence, but actually it's harder to evaluate the strength of the evidence because of this problem. <coughs> so what's our solution? Uh, we've got a new approach here that doesn't directly use the likelihood ratio, although you can think of it as being inspired by the likelihood ratio. Roughly speaking, the likelihood ratio um, or the match probability uh, amounts to what's the fraction of matching individuals among the among the population of possible sources. Now, the population of possible sources of the DNA is problematic, I've been, as I've been saying. Um, so let's just forget about that and just look at the top line. How many matching individuals are there? And then let, make, let the court make the other judgments. Um, so uh, we, although we don't know how many matching individuals there will be, uh, we can get a pretty good idea of the distribution by simulating under reasonably realistic models. Now, we can go further because I, you can actually take database information into account, and I'll come back to this in a moment. Um, but there is a warning that you do need to assume that the database is a random sample. I've said that's probably not the case for most databases. Uh, how much impact this has is hard to say. I think it's probably still you know, somewhat useful, the database information, uh, but you just have to be aware of that uh, caveat. And then, <coughs> It's difficult to report a whole probability distribution to a court. Uh, it's important not to be unfair to defendants, so we probably want to lean a little bit in the direction of the defendant and report an upper point of the distribution, like a 95 or a 99 percentile of the distribution of number of males matching the alleged contributor in the modifier. I put modified in brackets here because I mean modified according to the database information. So you can choose whether or not you want to use that database information. I'll give some numerical illustrations in a moment. <clears throat> so our simulation model, I'll just give you some of the details here. It's implemented in freely available open source software. And the second talk in this series tells you more about the software so that you can do your own simulations according to what loci are represented in your profile or what assumptions you want to make about the population. Um, we assume that the last three generations in a population are live and are the potential sources of the DNA. Uh, anything further back than three generations from the present, uh, we'll assume couldn't be a source of the DNA. Obviously, that's not precise. Uh, nothing is precise here, but we think the, the accuracy is good enough to be helpful to a court. Um, and I've already introduced the three profiles that we're looking at here. Um, I've, the, here's roughly point estimates of the mutation rates. The mutation rates are not known exactly. So my previous uh, picture showed that there is variability in the, and we do use a posterior probability distribution for the mutation rates, but the center, the mean, uh, if you like, of the distributions are around about these values here. And we'll call a 4% mutation rate low. That's just rather arbitrary. Um, power plus Y23 has about 8% mutation rate that we'll call that intermediate and Y filer plus uh, has a, a mutation rate about 13% uh, and we'll call that high. Um, now the first thing that will occur to you is that no uh, simulation model can capture real population accurately um, but that's where we're helped by the fact that this high mutation means there's not that many matching individuals usually at most a few tens and so that means the details of the population don't matter too much. Um, and in particular, the details of the mutation rate don't matter too much. Um, so that um, we um, give some details of our model here. So let me just go to the bottom point now that I've started on it. We use a symmetric stepwise mutation model. And of course, that's 
you know, an approximation to reality. It's not very accurate, but really mostly we're only concerned with individuals that, you know, the matching individuals mostly descend without any mutation uh, from a common ancestor <coughs> up to five or 10 generations ago. So the details of the mutation model don't matter. Um, they do exist two-step mutations. Uh, they make a little bit of difference, but that's a bit like two one-step mutations occurring one after the other. So it doesn't really make a, um, a big difference here. Um, we use the right Fisher population genetics model. If you've studied population genetics, you're sure to be familiar with that because it's a very standard model. Uh, it's just, you know, the simplest thing you could imagine. It has non-overlapping generations, which is not realistic, but that's another feature that we, don't, we think doesn't matter. Uh, no selection. Um, and it's haploid here because we're only interested in the Y chromosome. Uh, for population size, we consider constant populations or 2% growth per generation. Now, one uh, little extra detail that is important that you might not think of at first is you might think that a model where just every male has this reproduces at the same rate um, would be adequate. And the corresponding assumption is not too bad for females, but but for males, there is more variability in reproductive success. So uh, a model with all males having the same rate of offspring doesn't fit very well. <coughs> and that's standard in the right Fisher model. Um, so we've generalized our model to allow some variability. <coughs> so every male has his own personal rate of reproduction uh, and the variance is the key parameter controlling that. Um, so we saw, we found in the literature a recent US estimate of this variance being about 0.15. So we decided to go a little bit higher than that 0.2. Um, some human populations are as high as one or even higher, but those very high values don't exist in kind of large cosmopolitan populations. Uh, that would tend to be the case for some isolated populations uh, and particularly with some uh, marriage customs such as polygyny um, that can increase the variance in reproductive success. But broadly speaking, I think about 0.2 is a little bit on the high side for typical populations. So the first thing you might think about is to compare the simulations from your model with real databases. So we've done this here with a number of European uh, databases. Um, <clears throat> so there are some caveats to this because the databases are somewhat problematic. Um, and so we don't expect a close match. So what I've shown here in these green and orange histograms, uh, sorry, box plots, are um, the uh, constant population size with the last generation having 100,000 or 1 million individuals. And then the crosses here is the corresponding value from the real database here from different parts of Europe as uh, indicated uh, down below. Um, you'll see broadly speaking <coughs> that although it's not a close connection, that broadly speaking, we're in the right range for most of these characteristics. So we looked at different things. What's the fraction of singletons, which is quite high in all these databases? What's the fraction of doubletons, which is uh, profiles represented twice? Um, what's the most represented profile? How many times does it occur? And the second most. And you'll see that broadly speaking, we're in you know, the real databases within the range of our simulations, but there's a bit of an outlier for Northern Europe. But if we look a bit closer that some of the problems with the databases are highlighted because it turns out this is a convenience sample. The Northern European sample uh, has a higher representation from Finland. And for example, Norway isn't represented at all. Uh, Northern Finland has one of the most important population isolates in Europe, which is genetically distinct and a reasonably large population size. So, you know, we could be affected by how many individuals from, um, are, are from uh, Northern Finland. Um, and so that's not really representative of the whole Northern European population. Um, and in fact, these profiles, individual profiles that are highly represented much more than expected under the simulations here and here, um, all of those matching individuals come from Finland. Uh, and therefore, uh, whereas our databases are all randomly sampled, in the relevant simulated population. And so this discrepancy is not surprising and is not really a cause for concern. It just gives you some feeling for how good our simulations are in terms of reflecting um, real populations. But, it's, um, but as I said, because of the problems with the data, real databases, high accuracy isn't expected. So this is now we're getting to the important results for the most important property 
that affects the number of matching individuals is the mutation rate of the profile. So we've got our three profiling kits here with low, medium, and high mutation rates. And the curves here are telling you the number of matching individuals, that the probabilities over our simulations for having this many matching individuals as indicated on the x-axis. But one of the first things you notice is that um, the curves which represent different models, six models, aren't that different. So this is kind of backing up my point that the modeling assumptions don't matter too much for the level of accuracy that we think is, is appropriate here. Uh, you'll notice that um, the highest point is always at one in every case. Um, now we've included Q himself, the alleged contributor, as being one of the matching individuals. So we kind of treat Q as matching with himself. So this one corresponds to the situation where there's nobody else in the population matching Q. And it's the most likely individual outcome, but it doesn't mean it's very likely because if you look over here at these probabilities, they're all under 10% for any one particular value. Um, but because there are so many alternative values here, collectively, these numbers can be more important, but one is the individual highest. And then there's for kind of family size reasons, two get drops down quite a bit, then three jumps up a bit, and then it kind of settles down to a smooth pattern of declining probability as the number of individuals increases. And I haven't shown you the whole distribution here, that particularly for Y Filer, the distribution continues quite a lot out to the right here. But you can see that um, most of the probability uh, is for uh, fewer than 50 matching males, particularly for the high mutation rate Y Filer Plus. Uh, only when the variance in reproductive success is quite high is there any noticeable probability at all of having more than 50 matching individuals. So that kind of backs up my claim that broadly speaking, there's typically just a few tens at most of males matching a particular um, observed Y profile. Uh, so I put some numbers here. Um, the of the, they're just giving some statistics for um, particular models uh, that were shown in the previous, uh, uh, only the growth model in this case. Um, and uh, where um, I've highlighted in magenta, the, um, the variance in reproductive success being 0.2, which is the case that I said I thought was most uh, realistic. Um, so the mode is one in every case, as I was just highlighting and giving you the kind of reason for that. Uh, the median is uh, is quite a bit away from one in the order of several tens, but lower for the high with higher mutation rate. Uh, it's down to nine, the median value, uh, and then up in the tails, the upper tails, 95% and the 99%. Uh, you can see it's still just a few tens for the high mutation rate profile. Uh, it's getting up to a few hundreds for Y filer with its um, lower mutation rate. And there's more details and other models in our published paper, so there's no need to, to take that all uh, in now, but just to get an idea that you know the, nu the number of males matching your observed profile is typically in the order of tens, but for lower mutation rate, you know it can get up into the hundreds, and, and if there's a high variance from reproductive success, it'll be a bit higher. <coughs> Now, it's not directly relevant, but it's also interesting to look at how distant is the relationship between the alleged contributor Q and the alternative contributor that I've been calling X. And so that's given on the x-axis here. And it's a similar story to before, but, it, it, um, but if we look at the high mutation rate uh, Y filer plus here, you can see that it's, there's hardly ever more than 30 generations, 30 father-son steps separating matching pairs of individuals. Um, bigger than 30 does exist with the lower mutation rate profiles, but it's still getting pretty rare. So that's, ag um, that's again my point that all matching individuals are somewhat related. By, and again, I make the point that I don't mean just the known relatives like cousins and uncles. It's going out further than that, but they're still much closely related. Um, than random pairs of individuals in the population. And it's certainly not, you know, we just can't think of them as being completely unrelated individuals. That matching with completely unrelated individuals just doesn't happen. <laughs> so uh, coming back to the point I've raised earlier that you can take database information into account with a, a re-weighting of the simulations according to the number of 
matching individuals in the database. Now, I won't go into details here. Uh, the details are in our paper. At the top in Magenta, I've carried forward the information from previous slides when we don't use database information just for Y Filer Plus and only the growth model and only with variance and reproductive success equals 0.2. And so these were numbers you've seen before, median 9, 95% quantile 41 uh, and 99% quantile 63. How is that affected by database information? Well, if you observe zero matches in the database, it's hardly affected at all. A little bit of information if the database is, is 10,000, which is pretty large. Um, <clears throat> So that's because we already know because of the high mutation rate that we expect the profile to be rare. And so not seeing it in a database is not surprising and doesn't give you much new information. If you do see it in the database, that is a little bit surprising. And so it does change the statistics a little bit more for the median and not so much out in the tails, but there is definitely a noticeable effect. And if you see it twice in the database, uh, that has a, a a bigger effect, obviously, and starts pushing up um, the 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 ninety five percent quantiles towards to, towards a hundred and more than a hundred for the ninety nine percent quantile. So um, so the database information is informative. Uh, once again, requires the database to be a random sample in the population, um, which won't be exactly true, but um, might be a good enough approximation for this purpose, given that the database information is is not as important in our approach as in some other approaches. So how are we going to summarize this information for a court? Well, here's a, a, some suggested words that you could use. Um, you could say to the court, uh, we've done some population genetics modeling <coughs> and we predict with 99% probability that the number of males with a matching white profile that is matching the alleged contributor is at most 63. That's a number I plucked from the, from the previous slide. Of course, there's no suggestion here that this number is precise. And so you probably wouldn't say 63, you might round it to 65 or 70 or maybe even 100. Um, but I think that giving that number is, is I think very um, helpful to the court. And then uh, you, you can then add on the database information. Um, here, I've just supposed the database wasn't observed in a database of size 10,000. And as we saw, that reduces the 63 down to 60. Um, you might just combine those two pieces of information and just report the 60 to the court in the first place. Um, the only reason is to be just a little bit hesitant about this requirement for the database to be a random sample from the population, which probably isn't true. <coughs> and then you need to tell the court something about that these 60 or so at most, but right, the most likely value is much less than 60, but at most 60 with high probability, um, those individuals, those males are all male line relatives of Q, extending beyond known relatedness, but much closer than random pairs of individuals. And that means they might be similar in factors relevant to deciding who could have been um, the source of the DNA at the crime scene. <coughs> so place of residence and physical parents might be relevant and they might be similar for these somewhat related individuals. So we're getting towards the end. So I'll just um, summarize the, the key points again. Um, the, we've been emphasizing that uh, although we normally support the likelihood ratio for, uh, for measuring weight of evidence, there are some particular problems here um, that about the, uh, the number of, uh, about the, uh, the likelihood ratio depending a lot on the relatedness that we don't know. So we recommend instead uh, reporting an estimate of the number of males that have a Y profiling matching the alleged contributor. Mm -hmm. um, the key uh, parameter that determines this number is the mutation rate of the profile, but we've also seen that variance in reproductive success and, uh, is important and population size is, is somewhat important. Um, I've just briefly mentioned that for partial profiles, you can use the mutation rate of the observed loci and, and use the same approach. There's a little bit more on that in the subsequent talks. Um, and the other key point we've been making is that for high mutation rate, Y profiles, the number of matching males is small. Um, on, so that's good in terms of it doesn't depend too much on the various modeling assumptions, uh, but it is important for the court to be aware that they might be in the same area. Uh, they might 
resemble the alleged source of the DNA in some characteristics. Uh, and we've also made the point, I've just emphasized at the bottom here, that the LR or match probability is problematic for reasons I've been discussing. So I haven't yet said much about the lower mutation rate case. Um, we've uh, emphasized that our approach is particularly useful for the high mutation rate profiles. If you've got a lot of dropout or an older profile in kit without so many loci, then I think it's still useful to think about the number of matching males. I think that's something that a court can really comprehend quite well. But the lower the mutation rate, the bigger that number that will be and the more mi well mixed they'll be into the population so that a match probability is, is, is not so problematic and, and could be helpful to the court because it won't depend so much on deciding the population of, uh, of possible suspects. Um, so if you do want to take a match probability approach, uh, then we recommend the discrete Laplace method, which uh, my colleague Mikkel has contributed to the development of and has published some papers um, and that's described in more detail and with some references in talk four in this series. So I promised you that there would be a reference. Here is our PLOS genetics paper that all the results that I've mentioned here are in that paper. We published some, some later papers as well, developing the idea further and they'll be discussed in some of the other talks in this series. Um, the mutation data that we've used have come from published sources that are obtainable from the YSTR haplotype reference database uh, at this uh, web address. Um, just the final thing to say before I leave you is that um, the other webinars in this series are firstly an introduction to our software for doing the simulations that allow you to approximate the distribution of the number of matching individuals. Um, we treat in talk three, we treat some more advanced topics related to Y profile mixtures. And also, so we highlight some special advantages of our method. One is that if you do have some relatives of Q that are already profiled and the profiles available to the court, we can take that information into account. It modifies in some cases quite a lot, uh, the distribution of the number of matching males. And we're not aware of other methods that can, that can take that information into account. And we get some surprising result about mixtures that I look forward to telling you about in talk three. I just mentioned talk four on the discrete Laplace method. Uh, if you prefer to use a, uh, a, mutation, a match probability, which is a more traditional approach, and we think is probably okay if the mutation rate is not too high. Uh, and although this series is mainly about Y profile interpretation, naturally enough, this approach also has implications for mitochondrial DNA. Uh, which uh, is another important type of uh, DNA evidence. Uh, and we review the implications of our approach uh, in talk five in this series. So thank you for your attention. Uh, and that's the end of this talk. I hope to see you again in one of the later talks.